Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photograph announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here and on another side of the pond is... Becky! Oh right, how are you Bex? I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay yeah well that was short and sweet so let's talk news then <laughs> all right well a part of all the things happening in the world right now there was a cp plus which was virtual and uh, nikon had some videos to show us uh, one thing that we saw on that video was 800 millimeter z lens so in the flash which was really nice so we can actually judge the size of it and it looks like it's not going to be very big and heavy. No, it looks fairly small and light. And in fact, although the lens specs weren't actually announced, they they put a comparison photo up. So you can kind of see that the, the speaker, who was Takakawa-san, his hand's about 20 centimeters in size. So the total length of the lens is probably about 40 centimeters or less. And the maximum di diameter is about 10 centimeters or less. Okay, and another speaker said that basically it feels lighter than 500 mil f4 e lens, which is 3.1 kilograms. So that's a good indication it's going to be a small and light lens. Now, some comments on the, on the size of the lens. We've seen last month a um, GP review of forum post where people trying to get the size of the lens based on the roadmap that Nikon published. So there are some comparisons there. According to them, the diameter is going to be about 147 millimeter and the length of the lens is going to be about 392 millimeters. Now, let's think about this. So we had Canon just announced 800 mil f5.6, which mm. uh, priced at 17,000 American dollars. And then they also released a 1200 f8 lens as well, which cost a whopping 20,000 pounds. Well, let's talk about 1200 millimeters first, because, you know, that's a quick one. And then we move on to 800 mil comparison. So do you think Nikon will ever make 1200 millimeter lens? I would be very surprised if they make a 1200. I think that Nikon are usually more inclined to make more sort of... I think 800 is the longest that they've made in a very, very long time. There was that stunning, what was it, like a 1,200 to 8,000. It wasn't that much. <laughs> they made... There was, I think, 1,200 to 1,700 at 5.6 zoom, isn't it? Which was a bazooka. Yeah, exactly. And that that was also quite a rare lens. They tend to make more modest focal lengths as a rule and then just say, look, you can put a teleconverter on it. So I imagine that's probably what they'll do with the 800 mil. The, the new teleconverters are so good that actually you could put a 1.4 teleconverter on there and essentially get your 1200 mil that way. Push it this way, absolutely. And then an interesting thing that Seth pointed out on our last week's live stream, he said that lenses like this would generally build in such small quantities, they would really go to rental houses more than anything else because obviously otherwise it would have to you have to remortgage your house effects which you just to buy one of those so does it make sense for Nikon to release one I guess as a statement yes from let's say production point of view I think it's going to be such a limited quantities uh, does it make sense to just design a whole pipeline just for this particular lens but please viewers do tell us in the comments below now let's move on to comparison of 800 mil so 800 mil from Canon is 5.6 versus 6.3 on Nikon it looks significantly bigger as well. And I assume because of size and the aperture, it's also going to be more expensive. Obviously, the price of for Canon has been confirmed at $17,000. Do you think Nikon is going to be cheaper? I do think it's going to be cheaper. If we look at the, the price of the 400mm 2.8, and this 800mm is obviously not a premium lens it is going to be a, a pf lens so it will be smaller and lighter i just hazard a guess that it's going to be around the 10 or eleven thousand price mark but i don't think it's going to be as much as 17. that's mm. in pounds though not dollars absolutely absolutely you make an interesting point because if you compare it to 400 millimeter f 2.8 lens then nikon z version cost fourteen thousand dollars and uh, canon rf which is their z mirrorless system cost twelve thousand but then you're right it is probably fluorite and pf lens which means it's probably going to be priced accordingly. So yeah, as you said, if you mentioned 500, 5.6 lens, F-mount lens, it's not as expensive. So if you're looking at that price and then it does look like it's going to be cheaper as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether Nikon are trying to do something a little bit different with their 800 mil. They're not necessarily going for the premium top end professional market, but certainly something you still, in order to spend 10 or 11 or 12 grand on a lens, you still got to have a decent chunk of cash in your pocket so it's it's an odd one that canon have done something so different i would say it the question is whether or not canon's one is um 
is aimed at professionals or not. I assume it is with that price price tag. What well, what do you think that Nikon One is not going to be aimed at professionals then? I don't know. I mean, looking at the picture of it, it's got the gold band, right? So it is considered a, a pro lens, but it is so much smaller and lighter. Yeah, it's like a symbol of quality, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you. But in defense of Canon, they also have an 800 f11 version. So it's f11 lens priced at $999. So, which is cheap and cheerful, and I guess for, let's say, enthusiasts, it's going to be a good choice as long as you have enough light. Well, not in the UK, but other places. I don't know. Do you think just because Canon has two options and you can just going to release one and it's going to sit somewhere in between the two? And then while having a golden ring, um, so it's not going to be as expensive, but also it's going to be high quality. Yeah, that's my thought is that it might be exactly that, not quite the, the premium top end pro lens because they've got the 400 mil for that and... Obviously, at some point or another, we might see a 600 mil, but I, I don't think that the 800 mil is necessarily trying to be that lens. I don't know if they need it to be that lens. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, we have some comments from Nick and Rumors, and RC Jenkins, who we used several times, he had this to say. He said, I've mentioned below what I think are the approximate lens dimensions, 140 millimeter by 386 millimeters. It will be almost identical in size to the 500 F4 E F mount lens. As far as other aspects, some of these might be obvious. My wild guesses, some element guesses, like 20 elements, probably closer to 16, that the weight would be approximately two kilos or a little bit over. Mm. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because if you look at the video and uh, there's a guy passing a lens to another guy with one hand and it looks very light. So, so yeah, I, I tend to agree with him that it's going to be on a light side. Yeah, I, I mean, either that or that guy works out like seriously, <laughs> because being able to just casually hand over the lens with one hand. Just working his guns. Yeah, that's something you can't do necessarily with uh, with a lens that's any heavier than two kilos, I would say, maybe three at the most. But So you think he's basically flexing on the camera? I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of guesswork that can be done based on that one little screenshot of that video. <laughs> can you see me flexing right now? Yes, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah, see can it see right that? there. Because I can't, mm. I can't even feel it. <laughs> so RC Jenkins also said on the MTF charts that they think it will be super sharp above 90% across the board and closer to 99% for most of the frame. That's very interesting. That's an interesting statement. They reckon that it will be sharper than the 400 2.8S, which is the... I don't understand how that's possible, but anyway. That's just speculation, though. What do they mm -hmm. know? <laughs> What do they Absolutely. Know and then he thinks that the price is actually going to be lower because he guessed that it's going to be between 10,000 and 15,000 K. But observing and learning through the videos like this and others, he thinks that actually price will be between 8K and 12K, so centered around 10K, which is quite interesting. Again, this is based on a random comment on Nikon Rumors website, so to take it with a grain of salt, but since there's no concrete information, available as of yet so we can just guess based on the videos we have but in terms of announcement dates while it's still unclear Nikon France posted on their social media that uh, on 9th of May the French Nikon store will have 800 millimeter Z lens available for testing. Yes they've got something which is called Jeune Porte Ouvert Nikon Photo and Orient. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't speak French. No. Vous plaît. <laughs> <laughs> Should have done a Google Translate on that. Anyway, they seem to have an event which is also showcasing the 400mm as well as the Z9 on top of the 800mm. And based on the, the little bit that we can glean, because our French is, is non-existent, there may be birds <laughs> involved as well. <laughs> it's pretty much safe to say that 800mm announcement is imminent because we've seen the lens in the flash. It's pretty much out in the wild. So all we need to know is basically when it's coming in full specifications and the price. And I think we will see it very, very soon. Absolutely. Now for some Z9 coverage, there's a little bit more from CP Plus that we've seen. They've been talking about some Z9 custom shutter sound beta firmware. Hmm. <laughs> very useful. Aren't we glad that this is a possible firmware update? So the custom shutter sounds apparently included a cat meow, a speaker's voice, the D750 sound, the F4 sound. A popular vote was also held for the shutter sound and Nikon is positively considering the inclusion of this feature, which I personally find terrifying. Okay, so which one would be your favorite shutter click sound? I mean, I'd love just a standard, classic, you know, 
machine gun F5 sound. That was a heavy mm. sounding camera. But uh, if we were going novelty, novelty sounds, then maybe like bird chirping, that would be quite fun or mm. something like that. Okay. I think, yeah, I would have something like you're fired or <laughs> you are illegally parked on a private property or a bunch of other Robocop quotes. But could you imagine that at, at uh, like 20 frames per second? <laughs> Well, you see, I don't do that, but I think it would be it would be like one of those where, you know, people boomboxing on the street. So I think yeah. it would sound something like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, if that feature ever does come out, we will have a tremendous amount of fun making a video. Yes, I think if you didn't want to buy Z9 before, now you will. All right, so a couple more news on Z9. According to YM Cinema, Nikon confirmed that Z9 will be able to record ProRes RAW in the future film web dates. However, they still think that it may not happen. So basically, after the cancellation of the ProRes RAW feature in DJI RAW in 4D, Nikon Z9 buyers, according to YM Cinema, started to worry about the same will happen to their camera. So they reached out to Nikon and asked the simple question, will the Nikon Z9 allow internal recording of ProRes in a future film web update. What did they say, Becky? They said, thank you for your question. Currently, the Z9 can record ProRes 422HQ. This can be captured in 10-bit 422 video up to 4K ultra high definition 30p. This can be captured in camera currently. The future firmware update will allow for capture of 12-bit RAW video formats. These formats include NRAW, Nikon's original RAW video format, as well as ProRes RAW HQ. So, there you go. Nikon has confirmed that the Z9 will be able to record ProRes RAW HQ internally. Okay, they're still on the phase though, because uh, what they say, Nikon must pay a Red Digital, so you know the Red, the company that does uh, Red Digital cameras, they have to pay their licensing fees to a low internal ProRes RAW recording the Z9, and they hardly see Nikon fighting that. It's a difficult one because uh, those license fees been everywhere, so pretty much, so in terms of this, I don't see why not. I definitely think that we're going to see Black Magic RAW on Nikon cameras. You know, they had that in the past, and uh, it is compatible with uh, Black Magic RAW on the recording devices as well. But we shall see. Okay, according to Seth Miranda, who we talked to last Friday, he reckons 8K 60 frames per second, as well as other firmwares, will come for Z9 and other cameras in April. So I assume that ProRes hopefully will include him there. Hopefully not on 1st of April, because we all will be disappointed. Yeah, fingers crossed. It's nice to have a confirmation from Nikon with all those things. Unfortunately, yeah, I do agree with them. I would take it with a grain of salt because it would come from someone who doesn't have actually input into the firmware space. Very true. Tech Radar published an article called Nikon Explains Why the Z9 Ditches the Mechanical Shutter and Why It's a Big Deal. They spoke to product specialist Dirk Jasper, who told them why Nikon went all electronic in their shutter. Absolutely. The gist of it is they say that uh, electronic shutter can go to 32 thousandths of a second, which is obviously beast mechanical shutter, yada, yada, yada. We heard all this, but if you want to read this interview, definitely do check the link below. And then we had more Z9 tests. Photographer Igor Tudisko published a video on the dynamic range of Z9, and according to him, it equals to 14.33 stops. Now what he did is he basically took 78 shots with uh, X-ray patches and uh, basically from very bright to very dark and then compared it in the software and then according to his calculations we'll have 14.3 stops which is pretty good for camera of this time. Definitely. Now for some third-party news for you. Yongnyo YN85mm 1.8Z DF DSM lens for Nikon Z mount is coming soon and this is an autofocus lens for the Z mount system. Absolutely, it's going to Nikon rumors it will be announced on the 31st of this month. All right, I'm just gonna wait for 31st of February to come in and uh, wait for the announcement on that date. The 31st of this month? Yes. That's quite difficult considering <laughs> that it's February. I think we'll never see this lens being released. <laughs> if it's if it's going to come out on a 31st of February, we won't see it until the calendar is reimagined. Yeah, you can't even wait for four years, you see what I mean? It's even longer than that. That's right. We also have Casina who have announced three new Voigtlander lenses for the Nikon Z mount. They've announced a 50mm f2, a 35 f2 and a 23mm f1.2. Yeah, in the presentation they had in Japan, they showed all three lenses, as well as the previously announced with the, the 35 1.2 DX lens, uh, which was announced last week. So let's look into those lenses. So the first two are actually a big deal because it's APO Lanthar type of lenses. So those are aspherical lenses, they're apochromatic, they're one of the sharpest lenses 
from wetland lineup if you look at the reviews of the Leica versions of those lenses they are compared with the Leica equivalent so they are very very sharp so very interesting development both are full frame so you got 35 f2 and 50 millimeter f2 both will be priced about 1050 or 1150 dollars so while those prices have not been officially announced that's the kind of expected price of those lenses based on other mount equivalents now, they also announced a DX lens for Nikon Z mounts, and it's a 23mm f1.2 lens, a spherical. So this one is effectively equivalent of 35mm lens, which, again, Nikon doesn't have in their range. So this will be equivalent of 35mm f1.2 lens on something like ZFC or Z50. So now you have two DX options from Voigtland as well. So previously announced 35.12, which is equivalent of 50, and then 23 f1.2, which is 35mm equivalent. It's really nice, small and compact, not going to be very expensive. Nikon is lacking on those things, so I think it's pretty good. So because in the Nikon space, you could get those focus 31 1.8, but it would be a lot more expensive and a lot bigger as well. So if you're looking at something smaller and don't mind manual focus, of course, then those will be the right lens for you. So all lenses are developed under licensing agreement with Nikon and they will pass on the EXIF information via the pins on the lens. So this is a really good development. While those lenses are based on the lenses that were developed for previous models, the 23mm is a new one, and it's going to be developed together for Z-mount as well as like Fuji-mount lens as well. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely job. What do you think, Bax? I think it's nice to see what lens is coming to the place. We talked for about what lens for the last two weeks. And I think I, I enjoy that conversation. I think it's important to see a good manufacturer coming in. And as we said, we're hoping that other big manufacturers will step up their game as well. Yeah. And I think the nice thing about the Voigtlander lenses, particularly these smaller DX lenses, is they are sort of retro styled. So they're not exactly the same as something that Nikon would produce because Nikon would never design a lens now that looks like an old manual focus, almost looks like an old rangefinder lens. They're, mm. They've got quite a unique sort of aesthetic to them, which I think is great. So I'm very pleased to see it. Okay, there's so many third party announcements. So we had Mayer Optics also announced Gorlitz Trio Plan 100 of 2.8 Mark II lens for that mount as well. This one is very interesting. While it's quite expensive, it's priced about $1,000, the images it creates are very nice, swirly bokeh type of images which are very kind of similar to the classic lenses of the past just looking at the sample image it looks like it's a really creative lens which i quite like you know it's not something that nikon would make themselves because they're not necessarily going in for the swirly whirly bokeh they're looking for clinical sharpness and uh, subject separation this is quite different so it's uh, it's very exciting absolutely it's a very interesting to me that in the age of digital modern photography where everything is super sharp and clean we as photographers and videographers trying to actually dumb down the image and make it less sharp and less clinical and being more atmospherical so the lenses like this they come into place because of that we're starting to use those glimmer glass filters or promise filters just to get this kind of halation to the image etc etc and just to make overall image softer it's something similar to remember when back in the medium format days where people say the lens is so sharp that i actually used to you know kind of put vaseline or put like a you know a stocking over the lens just to create this kind of soft image out of it so it's very interesting that while the lenses are so sharp nowadays, we actually, as a photographer, trying to make them less sharp in a way. Yes. It's a yes from Becky. Perfect. Speaking of Maya Optics, uh, they also announced that there will be two more lenses coming in summer. So first one is Biotar 58 f1.5 Mark II, and the second one is Biotar 75 f1.5 Mark II lenses. Available for Z-mount, so around summer this year. Stay tuned. So we have a new contender to the third party lineup this time it's a camlan 55 f 1.4 which has been announced for the nikon z mount this is another one of those sort of all metal looking manual focus lenses it is an f 1.4 it's approximately just under 500 grams and they're actually making mounts suitable for the Sony FE mount, Nikon Z, and the Canon R mount. It's set to be released in May 2022, but we don't have a price as of yet. Yes, good news, everyone. And um, the thing, what I've, what I've noticed is I didn't know about this company before, so I kind of went on Wikipedia and tried to find what this company is. And apparently they were formed in 2016 and we're releasing lenses since then. So it seems like this is will be one of the first lenses for Nikon Z mount from them. That's very interesting. So we've got yet another contender on the third party Z lens lineup, which I like very much. I'm 
excited to see so many other brands just deciding to take the initiative. And, just not the good uh, ones. No, not the good ones. We want the Sigma and the Tamron. We not no household we names do. as of yet, but we do like to see that they are doing whatever it takes to uh, broaden broaden their market. Let's say. Agreed. And then, uh, in defense of Tequila, they did release a lens for Nikon Z mount as well as F mount, and it's not the one we all wanted, but it's four hundred millimeter f eight mirror lens. So it comes with a two times extender, and then you can buy either a mount for Nikon F or mount for Z. Basically, you attach it to the lens, you either screw it on, et cetera, et cetera, and then you put it on the camera. So uh, the good news is it's very inexpensive. It's priced at $249. So it gives you 400 of faith. You can get two times uh, teleconversers, which will push it to 800. And then whichever adapter you want, it priced at $29. Again, this will give you a very interesting rendering. It's what we call donut bokeh, which is very common to this type of uh, mirror lens. And uh, if you want to know more about this, you can do definitely go to the Tekino website for more samples. Fantastic. All right, we have more third-party news for you. There is a new Velo extension tube set, which is called the EXT or EXT dash NZ. So this is an autofocus extension tube set for Nikon Z mounts. It's been officially announced. It uh, comes in two lengths. You've got the 12 and the 20 millimeter. So quite similar to what Kenko already created mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for the Z mount. It's a bit cheaper. It's uh, just under $80. So this will allow you to put it on essentially any lens that it has a longer focal length than 12 or 20 millimeter. You can place the extension tubes on or a combined 32 millimeter and uh, get a closer focusing distance. And uh, you tested the Kenko lenses. Do, do they come with a three bits or two bits as well? Two. Two for the Z lineup, three for the F mount. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, those actually are slightly different. So the Kenko ones provide a 10 millimeter and a 16 millimeter extension, which means that the, I'd say that. Actually, I've tested the 16 millimeter on even the little 16 to 50 DX lens, as I do, and it still works. But uh, this is a slightly different range. So you'll get with the 20 millimeter extension tube, you should get a slightly closer focusing distance than you do with the Kenko 16 millimeter. Indeed. I mean, I'm looking at the Kenko extension tubes. They do look like they're better made, but they're also a bit more expensive. So if you're on the budget, definitely Velo is a good choice. Again, you will have also focus, so that will work as usual, but again, it's a difficult to use autofocus at such high magnification. So you really kind of want to pre-focus, I guess, first, just to be, be able to use it. Yeah, there are certain points when you use extension tubes where, to be honest, you are moving backwards and forwards rather than focusing the lens. It's usually recommended that you just focus at, for example, infinity or the closest focusing distance, and then you just adjust your distance between yourself and the subject. Uh, the other thing that they do maintain, including with these new extension tubes, is the image stabilization on the camera. So if you have a body with IBIS, then that will continue to work even while using these. Yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a risky business to shoot at such high magnifications handheld. But if you've got enough light, I guess that's possible. Yeah, jolly good. All right, so let's move on to review sections. We've got Camera Labs published a review of Nikon Z 400mm f2.8 lens. So finally, we started to get the reviews on this lens. And they genuinely love it. They give it a highly recommended, despite its high price, according to them. So what are the good points, Becky? They said it's got excellent resolution and contrast across the full frame at the 400 mil focal length. They like the built-in converter and say it's got very effective optical image stabilization. Along with very good close-up performance, little vignetting, practically no chromatic aberrations or fringing, reliable AF, nice bokeh good weather ceiling, and they said it has a nice lens pouch. Oh, wonderful. I'm very glad that the pouch is amazing and nice. So I just want to congratulate Nikon on this one. Most important. Exactly. So from both points, they didn't like relatively strong focus breathing. Tripod food is not Arcus Fizz compatible. That is a common thing on all of their reviews of Nikon long lenses. And then relatively high price, which we discussed. And in terms of this, yes, it is a high price for this, but for this, type of professional glass, 
I guess it's a reasonable price. I mean, I'm not, of course, I would want to pay £5,000 for it instead of 15000 but I don't think in this world it is possible. Unfortunately not. But overall, a really nice impression of the new 400 mil. I think we're going to start seeing more and more reviews coming out over the next few weeks. So do keep an eye out for those. Yes, Mark Irvin, who is going to be on our live stream with me this Friday, he tested the lens, so I am looking forward asking him all questions 400Z lens. Definitely join Con on Friday with Matt and uh, show your support for the live stream. He's doing a valiant job without me, that's for sure. I'm trying. <laughs> looking forward to my one month off somewhere in the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of the lovely Matt Irwin, he's actually done a review of the Viltrox 51.8 versus the Nikon Z 51.8 S lens. And he's entitled it Cheap One Any Good? Question mark. So he's shot some real world images with that. It's worth having a little look at if you're interested in how these sort of cheaper third party lenses perform and stand up against the, the real article. Yeah, he had actually an interesting comparison. He said that sharpness wise, they're quite close with, with the Nikon being slightly better. But then if you don't mind chromatic aberrations, then you can go for the Utrecht lens because those folks performance is roughly about the same. So if you need a pure image quality and Nikon design, then of course 518 is a perfect choice. But if you want to save a bit and keep the sharpness, then go for the Utrecht. He raised an interesting point, and uh, Seth mentioned as well, which I didn't think of before when we talked about third-party lenses. He said that basically if you buy a third-party lens, you need to be prepared that with a new firmware, your lens may not be compatible because they may break some sort of communication parts. And because those lenses effectively reverse engineer the autofocus system, then any new firmware can break that thing and then you will need to basically upgrade the firmware and the lens which may take time for them to release and punch up so it's an issue thing i didn't think of it before i thought in a way that you just buy the lens you, you just you know something like well we're thinking in terms of let's say sigma lens and tamron lenses per se and then you buy in lenses and it's pretty much guaranteed to work with all lenses but even in the past we've seen that some tamron and sigma lenses were not compatible with that cameras and then they had to issue an updates to do that so I didn't think of it. It's definitely something that I would now think of when buying a third party lens. I concur. <laughs> it's worth consideration, that's for sure. Yeah, and in the last two weeks, we also published a couple of reviews. So we did publish a 28 and 40 millimeter pancake reviews. Do, do check it out on our YouTube channel. And we also did a mini review of 18 to 140 lens as well, which is also available on our YouTube channel. Yes, go give those videos some love, please. We are actually at just under 12,000 subscribers. We would very much appreciate it if you would give us a follow just to push us over the 12K mark and uh, definitely give those videos some love and some likes. Indeed, I think 12K is better than 11K any day. Yeah, exactly. We've already plugged the live stream for this Friday, but it is at a different time just to help out dear Matt a little bit more. He um, asked if we could do it a bit earlier so that he's not streaming in the dark in his kitchen. Uh, so it's going to be at 12 noon UK time. So please adjust your schedules as necessary to join in with Con and Matt at 12 o'clock this Friday. Absolutely. Well, I wish our American viewers to get up a bit early if you can, grab a nice strong coffee and watch our stream at about 7 a.m. in the morning. Yes, I will also do my best to join you at 7 o'clock in the morning. We'll see. And then also the live stream that you did with Seth on Friday was fantastic. So if anyone hasn't had a chance to watch that yet, there were some very interesting discussions on all different camera brands, not just Nikon, but just a general kind of view of the market. And as Seth works for Adorama over in the USA, it's uh, it's interesting to see two different retail partners discussing what it's like in the market. So do go and have a little look at that if you haven't already. 100% agree. Very energizing conversation. I think when you're interested in something and you really want to speak how you feel, then people start to talk fast and people come to you, guys, you're talking fast, but there's so much information just cramped into one hour video. So you can change the speed if you want to of the video. Slow it down. Slow it down just to to get all that information. Exactly. Put a candle on, get comfortable in your armchair next to the fireplace and talk photography industry discussion with Seth and Korn. Yes. 
Now, for a slightly different read and watch for you this weekend, we've also got the Z9 wedding photography with the Nikon ambassador, Brett Florens. There is a video on the Nikon Europe YouTube channel about that. Yeah, nice techniques on studio photography and posing guides, which uh, a lot of photographers have difficulties with. Normally, we're good at taking photographs, but then when it comes to posing, experience shows. And generally, it's an interesting to see how photographers direct models into poses and how they get the shots out of it. So do check it out, it's very interesting. And then we're gonna to move towards wildlife photography where we had two videos with Brad Hill. So first one he had at, with Nick in Canada where they discuss Z9 in terms of wildlife photography. And then also the second video that he did is a discussion on ethics of wildlife photography, which is a very interesting conversation. I didn't think of ethics of wildlife photography because I just don't do wildlife photography, but for some of us who want to get into wildlife photography, I think it's going to be a very interesting watch. Very important as well. Indeed. And last but not least, Lens Rentals published an article called A Brief History of Early Lenses, Part 1. This article goes into the history of the first lenses ever. Again, for us photographers, it's going to be very interesting and educational material. Part 1 is available now, so I am eagerly waiting for the Part 2 of this article. Excellent. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. If you're on YouTube, please do give us a like, give us a subscribe. We would love to hit 12K subscribers as soon as possible. And if you're on a podcast platform, give us a follow and possibly even a review. That would be very nice indeed. If you want to find us on the Instagrams of the world, you can find Becky at... Rebecca underscore Danese. And you? At Konstantin Koshkin. Fantastic. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.